chapter six is all about solving trigonometric equations. And in order to solve trigonometric equations, you often need to use an inverse trig function. So we introduced those in 6.1. And now we're going to begin solving equations. And that's what we're going to do in 6.2, 6.3, and 6.4. So in 6.2, to start this process, we're going to look at solving equations using linear methods. So what does that mean? So linear methods would mean something like, just to compare to algebra, if you had 2x plus 7 equals 25, that's a linear equation. And linear methods would be where you isolate the variable by basically canceling out the things that were done to it in order to isolate the variable. So hopefully this kind of thing looks familiar. But instead of having an x, we'll have something like, you know, sine of x. We'll have a trigonometric function, and we'll try to get to the x inside, this, inside of the sine of x after solving something that's using a linear method. So that's an example just before we look at the ones that they give us of what they're talking about. Then we will then consider 0 factor property. So what are they talking about there? So again, algebraically, just to remind us of what that looks like from algebra, because when they bring it into this material, there's going to be trig functions involved. But if we were trying to solve something like x squared minus 7x, uh, I'll say equals uh, 0. Well, even better. Hang on a sec. Let's say you had x squared equals 7x. So from algebra, to solve an equation like this, we would want to recognize that this was a second degree equation. We would recognize that x occurs in more than one place in the equation. And so we would begin by setting the equation to 0 in order to use the 0 product rule. So I would actually begin by subtracting 7x from both sides getting x squared minus 7x equals 0. And the reason we set the equation to 0 was because we could then factor in order to use the 0 factor property or the 0 product rule it's sometimes called. I would factor out a common x from these two terms. And then by the 0 product rule, if this product equals 0, then one of the factors has to be 0. So since x times x minus 7 equals 0, then x equals 0 or x minus 7 equals 0. And then that gives us one solution right away. And by adding 7 to both sides, we get that x equals 7 is another solution. And so that's the zero factor property or the zero product rule to solve equations. So I'm just highlighting what these were in algebra so we can think about using them now that we're going to look at trigonometric equations. And then lastly, I'll just point out about the, uh, the quadratic methods. Well, this was a quadratic equation that I have right here. But if the quadratic equation could not be solved simply with factoring like this, like instead you had x squared minus 7x plus 5 equals 0 or something like that, well, you might say, oh, I don't really see a way to factor this. Well, then we would use the quadratic formula to get our two solutions for x instead of using the zero product rule. And we will do the same thing for more complicated problems, but instead of x, you'll have cosine of x or tan x or something like that. So these are the ideas that they're referring to when they talk about linear methods, zero product rule or zero factor property, quadratic methods, and the thing is, they don't review any of these from algebra. They just say they just start using them immediately. So you have to kind of, if you can, think about what you would have done in algebra and then try to do the same thing here when you have an equation with trig functions in them. All right. So having uh, tried to sort of summarize what they're talking about here, let's just look at their examples because they just start right out the gate with example one and they just have a bunch of them. We'll see how we can do with these. 
Okay, so in this first example, it says to solve, and here's the equation that we're talking about. 2 sine theta plus 1 equals 0. And they're asking us to find solutions for this equation, meaning theta values that will make the equation true. But they're saying that the values should be over this interval from 0 to 360 degrees. And, and what that means is, just to be clear, is that, that 0 is less than or equal to theta is less than 360 degrees. And so uh, in the video that I've already posted on Canvas with an introduction to solving trigonometric equations, I tried to spend a lot of time helping us understand what's going on in a situation like this. So briefly, just to summarize, and I do recommend you watch that video in Canvas to warm you up to the idea that I'm now about to summarize. In general, a trig function like the sine function, as we know, is periodic. That means if sine theta produces a number, like let's say sine theta comes out to be one. Well, there's a place you can find where that happens. Like we know that sine of pi over two gives you one, but because the sine function is periodic, there's infinitely many angles that would give you a one for sine with, with that angle when you take sine. And you can basically say, well, since the period of sine is two pi, if I take pi over two, that one gives me one. But if I add any multiple of two pi, I will also get one in the sine function. And so when you're trying to solve an equation and look for all possible solutions, if any value in the sine function is a solution, there's usually an infinite number of corresponding angular values that would also be a solution by just adding period values to the, the angle that you get. And so what they're doing in this case, instead of saying, well, instead of trying to come up with all of those infinite solutions, which they're actually going to do down here after they do the first part, they say, we just want you initially to give us the solutions that are between zero and 360 degrees. And, and you may, you can, so you can just consider that that are within one rotation around the unit circle. Um, because you're going between zero and 360 degrees. So even though there's infinitely many solutions, let's just look for the ones that are within one rotation of angle on the unit circle. So that's what that means. All right, so then how do we do that? Well, this is an example of the linear methods because if we look at the equation, if I think of the sine theta function as the thing I'm trying to isolate and solve for in order to eventually solve for theta, well, then this equation is basically similar to saying 2x plus 1 equals 0. So that's sort of what it looks like algebraically, but instead of an x, I have a sine theta. And so we would begin by isolating the sine function, and that will involve linear methods that we would have used to isolate x in the equation 2x plus 1. So they take the equation and they subtract one from both sides so that it looks like this. And then after that, they divide both sides by two. And at that point, they have isolated the sine function in the equation. Now, to find solutions, we need to find values of theta that satisfy the equation. And we're trying to isolate the theta variable, but they've gotten down to the point where the only thing that's in the way of isolating theta is we need to get rid of the sine function. So at this point, they actually just use guess and check. So we have a very simple equation. They're not really bringing in the inverse sine function or anything like that. And honestly, solving trigonometric equations will often have a little bit of both of these things going on. So just let's take a look at what they do here. They basically observe that sine theta to solve this equation comes out to be negative one half, and you get a negative value in quadrants two, uh, three and four for the sine function. The sine function is the y value of the point on the unit circle. So for that to be negative one half, you could look at the unit circle as they're doing in this diagram, and they're showing, look, they're saying on this line, that's where y is negative one half, and that hits the unit circle at these two points, 
And then we can remember that the way we can figure out what values of angle you would need would be to use reference angles. So they, they basically remind us that to get a, a, a one half value, either positive or negative, uh, for the y value, you need a reference angle of 30 degrees. And so to get these negative one half sine values in the third and fourth quadrants, you would need to go below the x axis 30 degrees, either on the right or on the left. And if you do that, the angles that would lead you there within zero to 360 degrees are 210 or 330. You're either 30 degrees below 360 or you're 30 degrees below the axis where 180 is, giving you 210 or 330. So all they do is say the reference angle is 30 degrees because sine of 30 degrees is one half. That's guess and check. They're saying it is 30 degrees because that's the right answer. And then using the diagram, they're saying, well, that means this is the solution set. And that both of those angles, 210 degrees and 330 degrees, are what you get. So that's, uh, that's something that you may or may not feel comfortable with. And as a general strategy, we can't solve trigonometric equations like this. But this is a simple one. And what we can do using this simpler one is visualize the idea of how we can capture answers within one circular rotation of theta on the, um, on the unit circle. And then we can also discuss how to extend that to all the other solutions that would work as well if you don't have that restriction. Okay, well, keep in mind, we could also check these solutions like with any equation, you could plug in those angles for theta and make sure that in the original equation, you end up getting a zero. But they then say, all right, well, now that we found these couple of solutions that are between zero and 360 that are within one rotation on the circle, how could we then find all solutions to the equation? And it says to find all solutions, we would take the ones we got that are within one circle of rot angular rotation on the, on the unit circle. And we would add integer multiples of the period of the sine function to each of those solutions that we found. So for example, when you're at 210 degrees, that's the same as being at 210 degrees plus 360. Because if I take 210 and go another 360 around, I land right back on the same spot on the unit circle. And so I would get that same value for sine. Or if I subtracted 360 degrees from 210 degrees, then I would be right at that same spot. Any addition or subtraction of 2 pi or 360 degrees, the period of sine, from 210 degrees will land you right back on the same spot and give you the same sine value. And if you're getting the same sine value, then you're also solving the same equation. So how do we then annotate this? How do we describe this? How do we write out this infinite collection of solutions? So it says, solve in this equation for all solutions. To find all solutions, take the solutions you got within one rotation of theta, 0 to 360, and add any integer multiples of the period of the sine function to each of those. So this is what this looks like here. They write it out in set notation. So this is the, the, what's called the solution set. And so let's just look at the notation. 210 degrees was one of the solutions there. And then they're saying plus 360 degrees times n, where n is any integer. So that means n could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, any integer, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, et cetera. And every time you take one of those values for n, multiply it by 360, add it to 210, you get another solution to the equation. So there's infinitely many solutions. And the same is true for all 360 n multiples added to the other solution in the first rotation of 330 degrees. So uh, some, uh, some terminology I introduced in my earlier video is that when you have these initial solutions that you then expand upon to get all the solutions, 
One of the ways to refer to these is root solutions. So basically to solve trigonometric equations in general, the big picture idea is that you initially try to find root solutions and then you extend those to be all possible solutions using the periodicity of whichever trig functions are involved. So in the case of the sine function, since it has a period of 360 degrees, you could take those two root solutions at any multiples of 360, and you then get an infinite collection of solutions to the equation. All right, well, they, they go over lots of examples, more than we're gonna be able to cover. So let's keep pushing forward as time permits. So in example two, they look at using that second algebraic technique that uh, I refer to as the zero um, product rule, or they refer to as the zero factor property. And so here's the equation we are tasked to solve. Sine theta times tan theta equals sine theta. And we want to solve that over an interval, again, of 0 to 360 degrees. So as I'm pointing out that on this interval, we'll find any root solutions. Now, it may be for a given problem that they never ask you to find all of the solutions. They just want the ones over a particular interval. And they could give you a totally different interval. They could say, find the solutions over the interval from 360 to 720. Maybe they want the solutions that would occur with a second rotation around, angular rotation around the unit circle or something like that. They can give you any range that they want. It is very common that they'll give you a one period of the function, one period range, so that when you're finding solutions, you're finding the root solutions. And that's what they do in this case. Now, so this equation is a little bit more like what we were talking about before. I now have these two different things. I have sine theta and tan theta, these two different trig functions. And so I could think of this as like an x times y equals x. And so how would I think about a way to solve this? Well, again, anytime you have a situation where you have a product of variables in an equation or something like that, we think about using the zero product rule. And to do that, you first set the equation to zero. So I would have x, y minus x equals zero. And then I could factor out x and get x times y minus one equals zero. And then I could see that that's true if x is zero or if y equals one. So that's what it would look like sort of with algebra. So then they do that with the trig function. So that's, that's sort of the, the motivation. That's the motivation. So they start with the equation and they, they said subtract sine from both sides, subtract sine theta from both sides. But they never explain why you would do that or how you would know to do that. So that's where we have to get behind the mindset of the person solving the problem. And that's where I want to try to fill in some details for you. So yes, they subtracted sine from both sides of the equation here. But why did they do that? In order to set the equation to 0. And why are they setting the equation to 0? To use the 0 product rule. <laughs> So if you just look at this equation, how do you decide how to begin or how to start this? You have to, in your mind, say, all right, let me see if I can use the zero product rule by setting the equation to zero and factor it. That's what leads, that's the motivation that leads to their first two steps, which they don't really explain here, which is not ideal. But that's what I'm for. I got to get my, my money's worth. Okay, so then in the next step, now that we've set it equal to zero, you factor. Because when you factored and you have a product that's equal to zero, then you can use the zero product rule. So they factor out the common sign and that produces the product that you have sine of theta times tan of theta minus one, that that product equals zero. And then they can apply the zero product rule 
which says if a times b equals zero, then a equals zero or b equals zero. So in this case, if sine theta times tan theta minus one equals zero, then sine theta equals zero or tan theta minus one equals zero. And then when you've broken it up into uh, different equations for each factor, then you can solve those equations much more simply. So at this point, they are again, sort of keeping the equations that you have to solve pretty simple. We're in example two here, not too deep in yet. And that they're solving them by guess and check. So how would you solve that sine theta equals zero between uh, zero and 360? They just say, okay, here's the solutions. So sine theta equals zero leads to these two root solutions. And again, when I'm saying root solutions, I mean angle values within one cycle around the circle that would solve the equation. So sine theta is equal to zero twice when you go around the unit circle, once when you started and once when you get to 180 degrees. So they just say, those are the solutions between zero and 360. And then the other one, which translates to tan theta equals one, when you add one to both sides to the other factor, well, then they say, all right, well, between zero and 360, where is tan theta equal to one? They're not using the inverse tan function. They're not doing any fancy. They're just saying you could, you would know that because of the friendly angles that we've worked with with tangent in the past. You could look it up on a table of values, but at this point, they're hoping to, you could just guess and check that you would say, oh, well, that's going to translate into theta. That equation would translate into solutions for theta being 45 degrees. That's the 45 degree angle in quadrant one or 225 degrees. That's the 45 degree angle in quadrant three. And in both of those angles, tan theta comes out to be one. Well, since either one of these could be zero and that would solve the equation, then all of these possible angles are solutions. And so they take the two that we got that make sine theta equal to zero and the two that we got that make tan theta equal to one and they collect those together to form the solution set, all those four. So you'd like to try to put yourself in the mindset of the person solving these because obviously you're gonna have to turn around and say, after having seen this, can I solve things like this myself? And so I'm doing my best here to explain the motivation behind each step, not what did they do, but how did they know to do that? Because that's what puts you in a position where you could actually do the same thing if you don't, if you know how they know to do what they did. Okay, let's move on. So they have a little caution here. Um, it says trying to solve the equation in example two by dividing each side by sine theta would lead to tan theta equals one, which would give two of the solutions we got, the 45 degrees and the 225 degrees. The missing solutions are the ones that make the divisor sine theta equal to zero. For this reason, avoid dividing by a variable expression. So what are they talking about here? <laughs> Again, it's sometimes hard to try to see the point that they're trying to get at. And I think it's easier, again, to see it using algebra, not using the example they have. So they had the equation here, sine theta times tan theta equals sine theta. And they're saying, if you had divided both sides by sine, you only would have gotten some of the solutions. So let's, let's just look at this for a second to see if I can make this caution clear, because they're trying to help you to avoid making mistakes. So they're saying if you had the equation sine theta, tan theta equals sine theta. So what we did in the above example and what I was describing here was we first set the equation to zero and then factored. But they're saying, well, what if somebody had thought about just saying, well, I'm gonna just get rid of the sine because it's on both sides. I can divide both sides by sine theta. Then if I do that on the right side, I would get, oh, that's not what I want, there we go. 
on the right side, I would get a one because sine theta divided by sine theta is one. And on the left side, I just have tan theta. So this would lead me to tan theta equals one. That's what they're describing as something you should avoid. And so what they're showing here is that if you did this, this tan theta equals one, that gives you the 45 degrees and the 225 degrees. But we're missing the idea from above that you also get solutions when sine theta is equal to zero. And the reason we're missing those is we just eliminated the sine from the equation. When you divide both sides by sine theta, that's only valid if you assume sine theta is not zero because you can't divide by zero. So if I divide by sine theta, I'm saying, well, that can't be zero. But actually, sine theta could be zero. And if it was, it would solve the equation because we'd get zero on both sides. So we also need to find values of theta that would cause sine theta to be zero. And that's preserved when you use the method we described up here. But if you tried to wipe out the signs from both sides using this method, you would lose those solutions and you would be incorrect when you gave the solution set because you'd be missing possible answers that are valid. So that's what they're trying to describe here. Hopefully that helps. Example number three, here we go. Just keep going here. So here's our equation, solve tan squared x plus tan x minus two equals zero. And again, they're saying, we just need to solve this over one, um, one rotation on the unit circle from zero to two pi. Now, one of the things we might wanna point out here is that zero to two pi is not the period of the tan function. The tan function actually has a period of just pi. And so it's very common to just think about once around on the unit circle to try to get your solutions just as a general way of practice. Again, in general, to be thinking about what are the root solutions. And then you can always get other solutions by adding multiples of the period of the function. But having said that, what kind of an equation do we have here? Well, again, if you were thinking of the trig functions as a variable, then this would be something like u squared plus u minus two equals zero. And that's a quadratic equation. And we typically solve quadratic equations by trying to factor and use the zero product rule as we just did. Or if we can't factor by using the quadratic formula to get the two solutions that way. So if you can look at that equation with the tan x's in it and think about it like approaching a quadratic equation, that'll lead you in the right direction for how to work with the equation. So we can see then, what did they do here? It's already set equal to zero. So then they factor because then when you have a product, as I was saying before, then you can use the zero product rule. So they take basically u squared plus u minus two and recognize that that would factor into u minus one times u plus two equals zero. But in this case, instead of u, we have tan of x. So in this case, this equation factors into tan x minus one quantity times tan x plus two quantity equals zero. And then by the zero product rule, if the product is equal to zero, one of those factors has to be zero. So that means then that tan x minus one equals zero, which immediately translates into tan x equals one or tan x plus two equals zero, which would translate into tan x having to be negative two. So if either one of those things is true, the equation above will be solved. It'll be a solution for that. And so we wanna find solutions for either of those and combine them together like we did in the previous example. Now, what they're doing to extend our learning a little bit in this example is that they're giving us one of these equations that, like in the first two, we could solve by guess and check. 
So they're saying the solutions for the first one, 10x equals one over the interval zero to two pi are, and they just give them to you. Pi over four and five pi over four. And again, those are exactly what we had up here because here we had 10 equals one, two. They just use degrees instead of radians. But now they're using radians and they're saying, all right, well, we can see what those solutions are, but what about where 10x equals negative two? Those are not so friendly. So because the other equation we need to solve here to find the rest of the solutions is not really something we would do by guess and check, they're using this to introduce what you do when you can't use guess and check or when the answers are not obvious. And so as we move forward here, we're now focusing on, all right, now how do I get solutions for this other part? I already have root solutions of pi over four and five pi over four, but what would be the solutions between zero and two pi for 10 x equals negative two? Well, that's where we say, all right, well, then we need to bring out like an inverse trig function and perhaps get some approximate solutions. And that's what they do here. So let me, let me sort of take this right here above and show what we then do. So if we have tan of x is equal to negative two, then like any equation, if we don't have an obvious idea what the answers are, we try to isolate the variable. So to get rid of tan and get x by itself, I would take the tan inverse of both sides. And then tan inverse of tan would cause this to cancel. And then I would be just left with x. It has to be equal to tan inverse of negative two. And here is where we need to start to use our discussions about inverse trig functions from the first section of the chapter. So getting to this point first, let's see then how they're going to deal with it. So then it says, based on the range of the inverse tangent function, based on the range of the inverse tangent function, It says this number is a number in quadrant four, this number that they get, this negative number. So this is because for the inverse tangent function, the range of that function was negative pi over two to positive pi over two. And so in that range, we're going to have values that we can look up and try to see where they are in um, by, by I'm explaining this badly, but so, well, let's say you typed it on a calculator as they illustrate here, you'd get this number, negative 1.1 something, 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 something. And so you could imagine, well, where is that? The calculator tells me that's the solution the inverse tangent would give, but it's a negative number. So clearly as a radian measurement, that's not between zero and two pi. That's not between zero and two pi. And so there, you could imagine where it would be by thinking about, well, how would I get to negative two um, if I was you know, circling around the, a circle? Because we're taking the tan inverse of negative two. We're saying, what angle in tangent would produce a value of negative two? And the angle it's giving is negative 1.107. And so as they illustrate here, that's if I back up this amount, well, actually here's the first place. If I back up here, if I back up negative 1.1 because I have a negative number, I end up with a particular point. But as they point out, that's in quadrant four and it's with a negative number. So what I need to do is find out how I would get that exact same value in any angles between zero and two pi. Any angles between zero and two pi. So one of the ways to take that, uh, to figure that out is to get the exact same position that was indicated by the inverse trig function and to get it to be between zero and two pi, since it's a negative number, I would just add two pi. Negative two pi is like a little bit more than six, right? 6.28, something like that. So if I take a negative one and add negative six, I'm gonna get about five. 
and five will be between zero and two pi, whereas negative one was not. So that gives me an answer. And that gives me the answer that they, they show down here. We have this 5.1760. So I got that by taking the solution provided by the inverse tangent and adding two pi to get a value that was within zero to two pi range. However, we have to also recognize on the unit circle that the tangent values in quadrant four are also produced in quadrant two because you have a period of pi. So all values of tangent between zero and pi and between pi and two pi are just repeating. And so if I want to find a solution between 0 and 2 pi, and I find the one that's between pi and 2 pi, I need to find the corresponding one, which is on the opposite side of the circle, that's between 0 and pi. And so I can get to that one by taking the original answer, and instead of going all the way around the circle by adding 2 pi, I can just add 1 pi to that. And then I get to the point on the opposite side of the circle, which will have the exact same tangent value of negative 1.1071. And that's how they come up with this extra solution of 2.0344. So I would describe these two solutions as the root solutions for tan inverse of negative two, or the root solutions for the equation that tan of x is equal to negative two. Those are the solutions within the first cycle of zero to two pi on a unit circle that would cause the tangent to give you negative two. So putting those two solutions together with the uh, first two solutions that they got by guess and check, they end up with this solution set of four solutions. And they point out the two of them by guess and check, they were able to produce the exact values and the other two, because there is no nice guess and check answer for tan inverse of negative two, the other ones, they use the tan inverse function and came up with approximate values for the other ones. So that's a lot. Questions, comments, discussions about example three here? Anything I should explain better or elaborate on if you're confused and you're willing to ask a question? Um, so the answer answer is a four. Right? Like the solution set there is are four. four solutions, correct. It within zero to two pi. Okay. Now, if they just ask for all solutions, you would take either one of those zero to pi solutions. There was two of those. If they asked for all solutions, you would take this one and this one that are between zero and pi. Yeah. And you would say either one of those plus any multiple of pi is a solution because pi is the period of the tan function. All right, let's keep going. <laughs> There's plenty to do. We'll do what we can. Now, I did want to do something further down. So let's take a quick look at this, but instead of going over all the details, let's just see what's going on here briefly and then move on to the next one. So what they do in this case is they have this function, I'm sorry, this equation to solve. And again, if I imagined the trig function here was a variable, this would be like u times u plus three equals one. And so if we were trying to solve this, the first thing we would do is we would distribute and set the equation to zero. So they set the equation to zero here, but then we would try to factor and use the zero product rule. And if we're looking at u squared plus three u minus one equals zero, if you tried to factor that, you would run into trouble because what you'll see is that this doesn't really factor nicely. And so when we had a quite quadratic equations like this, that did not factor and they were set equal to zero, then we would just use the quadratic formula. And so in this example, that's what they do. They use the quadratic formula where you have A, B, and C, 
when it's in quadratic form and you plug those into the quadratic formula. So what that does is that doesn't give you solutions for X, that gives you solutions for cotan of X because that was the trig function in this case. And when they get these two solutions, again, these are two solutions for cotangent of X, well, those are definitely not friendly values. So then they use the cotan inverse function to get decimal solutions for those. They basically take the cotan, inver cotan inverse of each side, and then you get these two decimal approximate solutions. And because the cotangent function, like the tangent function, has a period of pi, they point out, as I was alluding to in the earlier problem, that to find all solutions, you would add multiple integer multiples of pi, and that produces an infinite solution set like this, where you take the two solutions you found and say, then start adding any integer multiple of pi to get any other solutions for the equation, and there'll be infinitely many. All right, so I know that was brief, but there isn't any tricky things there to explain other than that. And I do wanna have enough time to get to some stuff that's coming up here. So one thing is a principle I wanna point out in this problem about checking solutions. And this may be something that students have forgotten from algebra. In this case, they're going to have a, a situation where in order to solve the equation, they square both sides of the equation. And I'll point out in a second why they do that. But when you do this, then it's possible to get false solutions to an equation. And maybe you remember this from, um, Algebra, maybe not. So I'll give you an example. If I have uh, an algebra problem that had like the square root of x equals three, and I wanted to solve that, I would square both sides, and that would leave me with x equals nine. And in this case, that's a valid solution because if I plug the nine into the original equation, I get that the square root of nine is three. However, this, you have to always check your answer like I just did, because if the original equation instead had been the square root of x equals negative three, then I would square both sides to get rid of the radical sign as we just did. And I would also end up with the solution that x is equal to nine. But then when I plug the nine into the equation, the square root of nine equals negative three, that's false because radical nine is positive three, not negative three. So after checking, I would have to eliminate this. I would have to say, no, that's not a valid solution. And actually that equation has no solution. So maybe that's familiar from algebra, probably not. But nonetheless, hopefully this refresher helps you at least think about this. And in general, what that means is that when you square each side of an equation as a way to try to find solutions, solutions must be checked or verified. And the way you check or verify solutions that you get is you plug them into the original equation and see if they work. And so we can sort of move forward and you can follow along with how they were able to isolate and get solutions. And they have tan x, equals negative root three over three. And again, that's an example where on a table of values for tan x, that would be a friendly angle of five pi over six, or on a unit circle, you could add pi to that and get 11 pi over six as well. So we have these two possible solutions on the unit circle. But then what they point out is that since the solution was found, since the solution was found or the solutions by squaring both sides, we must check that the proposed solutions are valid, that are solutions of the original equation. And what they found when they checked here is that the first one, five pi over three, is not a solution, but that the other solution they found is a solution. And so one of the properties of solving equations that they're trying to remind us from algebra 
and illustrate in a trigonometric equation here in example five is that if during the solving process you square both sides of the equation, any solutions you find at the end must be checked. And so this example five is a good way to uh, illustrate that. Okay, so lastly then, seven minutes left, perfect. I think they might do an example or two after this, but we don't have time for that, but they have a nice uh, couple of boxes here to sort of sum up or summarize their solving trigonometric equation uh, strategies or thoughts. And so let's look at through these, see if there's any questions about any of these, see if hopefully these make, make some sense, at least with the five examples that we scanned through up till this point. So first, decide whether the equation is linear or quadratic in form so you can determine the solution method. And again, what that means in general is in terms of the trig function. So obviously an equation with a trig function in it is not a quadratic equation, but we say it's in quadratic form if the equation, the trig function itself, if treated like a U variable or something would then look like a quadratic equation. If the equation occurs, I'm sorry, if the trig function occurs one time without any power on it, then that's in a linear form. But if it occurs in multiple places or squared or something like that, then you're typically going to set that equal to zero and simplify to see if you have something where you could either factor or use the quadratic formula in that quadratic form. Now, then it says if only one trigonometric function is present, first solve the equation for that function. So if you only have sine x in your equation, it may occur in more than one place, but try to isolate the sine x function and then you can use an inverse sine or guess and check on a unit circle. Now it might be that you have to use a quadratic formula to do that. So we had an example like this with the tan x function where they gave us that in quadratic form. But as long as only one trig function is present, then you would try to just isolate that trig function so that you can then solve. If more than one trigonometric function is present, like we had an example above where there was a sine x and a tan x in the same equation, then rearrange the equation so that one side equals zero, that's where we set it equal to zero, then try to factor each factor and set each factor equal to zero to solve, use the zero product rule. So if you have two different trig uh, equations like sine x and tan x, sorry, two different tan trigonometric functions like sine x and tan x, well, then you're not going to be able to isolate either one because the other one is roaming around there. And you can't combine them together because they're not like terms. So that's why you really have to set the equation to zero and use the zero product rule. Now, the other possibility is that maybe one of those trig functions could be converted into the other so that you end up with only one trigonometric function. But to do that, you'd use some sort of trigonometric identity. And we're going to look at things like that in like 6.3 and 6.4. And then a couple more here to finish up. If the equation is quadratic in form but not factorable, use the quadratic formula, as we just saw an example illustrating that check that the solutions are in the desired interval. Always keep in mind that if they give a desired interval, you need to find solutions in there. If you find solutions that are outside of that, you might be able to add multiples of the period to find the solutions that are inside the desired interval. Usually the desired interval will be like one circle around, uh, one cycle around the circle like zero to two pi, but they could give you, for example, an interval from four pi to six pi or something like that. And you could just add multiples of the period until you get into the interval that they want. And then lastly, try using identities to change the form of the equation. It may be helpful to square each side of the equation first. In this case, check for extraneous solutions. So they had one example of that where we squared both sides. And then we had to check the solutions after we did that. And we'll be looking at more examples similar to this uh, in the coming sections as well. 